Hi, everyone, and welcome to another interview. Here we have Julio, Julio. How do you say your name, actually? Julio, Julio. 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 Perfect. Yes, sir. Got it. All right. So Julio here joined my program March 9th, 2021. And his story has been quite incredible, too. And I think it'll be very, very re relatable for a lot of you as well. So I guess, Julio, if you could start here by painting us a picture of how things were like in the beginning before you met me. And I know you have like a really in-depth story uh, before you even joined the program, right? So tell us like, outline for us, what happened in the beginning? Well, uh, my wife and I have been together, I guess going, actually next weekend we'll be 15 years married and 22 years together. Uh, so basically we're kids and we met. And uh, for the most part, our relationship has been pretty good. We, uh, we're pretty compatible, even though we're very different people. And um, I don't know, for the first 15 years or so, it was good. Uh, and then as, as we talked about and as I've seen it happen, uh, I think you referred to it as entropy setting in. And we basically became two people living together. Um, me, myself, personally, I, I get so busy, cut up with work and all those things that there are things that I just wasn't paying attention to. Things that I was assuming were okay, but were not. And um, I, I think that it, it led to what you call there was no... There was no emotional safety to be able to talk to me because I react to everything. Mm -hmm. I try to defend myself, trying to justify actions and all those things, right? And um, I don't know. I had some setbacks, some things that led to some personal stresses. And uh, honestly, I wasn't paying attention to anything. And um, it led to some some arguments. It led to some things happening. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, she would come in from a long day of work. Um, she would be 30, 40 minutes late. And instead of... Uh, being compassionate and, and talking to her about her day, I'd be like, where are you being? And assuming that that she wasn't where she was supposed to be, uh, creating things in my mind that really weren't there, right? Um, so essentially, right before I, I found you and I joined the program, um, again, we became really two people living in the house, taking care of two kids uh, and just going through the daily conversations of, you know, hey, uh, what's what's for dinner and what's for breakfast and you pick up groceries? And yeah. that was really about it. Gotcha. So I think this is a very classic case of a relationship that's gone stale over time. And I think it's gone stale because usually it starts off with both people. In this case, I'm talking to you. So you being complacent into into looking at your relationship and going, okay, we're pretty, pretty compatible. We've been together for a long time. So I don't need to try as hard. I don't need, there's nothing going wrong here. Right. But what you don't realize again is that there's so much you don't know, right? Safety gets pulled under the rug from you in a very subconscious way. And often the problem with safety issues is that you don't know you're having safety issues because your partner is not going to tell you about it. Right. So, 100%. Often That's you right. don't know that it's happening. And second, I think, is life gives you crap. That's the nature of entropy. And when, when you're going through tough times, you always have this voice in your head that says, I am justified. I deserve to just let loose of it, to not be my best self So yet. And if other people it's like, expect you to be your best self during your tough moments, you're gonna, just going to say, don't expect that. Like, I'm going through a rough time. Can't you take me? Can't you like treat me well when I'm going through a rough time? You know, so it's almost like playing the victim mindset where like I deserve yes, this, this babying a little bit. Go ahead. Absolutely. No, no. It's interesting that you say that because that is literally a line that I use a, a year ago to a year and a half ago was like, hey, when I'm having a hard time, I expect you to pick me up. How come you can't pick me up? I'm having a hard time I'm being stressful. And we don't realize from our perspective uh, that our partner also has her stresses and her daily issues. How come we're not picking them up, but we expect yeah. them to do it for us? Yeah. So I think the staleness uh, you mentioned in one of your posts too, that the staleness eventually led to your partner actually having an affair and that actually made things a lot worse. So tell me about that. Tell me what happened there and tell me what you felt when your partner had an affair and what you did in response to it when you went. Well, when you uh, so it's essentially, I think at this point, it was actually during this month last year, um, I was, I was overweight. I was close to 300 pounds. Um, I was stressed. I was depressed. Um, we would come, she'd come in the house. I wasn't having conversations. I was glued to the TV when I was getting off work. And, um, uh, there was, I mean, there was really nothing there. And so 
Um, I think a, a conversation came up of, hey, I'm, I think I'm going to go this weekend and, and spend some time with a friend of mine, um, a female friend of hers, is what she said. Oh, well, I thought it was strange. Didn't think nothing about it. You know, I think that was a Friday night. The next Friday night, and mind you, we've been together 20 years. This is not typical behavior. I'm going to go spend a night with a friend, you know. But I, again, I, you know, I didn't want to argue because I was tired of so I didn't say anything. Uh, the following weekend, same thing. Friday came around. Hey, I'm going to go hang out with a friend. And so at that point, I was like, well, something is definitely going on here. And so, you know, when you're in a toxic relationship, I went and I dove to cell phone records. And, and I found a specific phone number that was conversations with. And I followed that up by, by looking for that number and trying to figure out who it belonged to. And honestly, Jeff, I didn't react because at that point I was really defeated. Like, I mean, I blame myself for it. It's my fault anyways, because I'm just not being a husband. I'm not being a friend. Yeah, but it's like almost like an active or passive form of this. So some people, when they find out about the affair, they get pissed off and they are folks showing the active form of anger and so on trying to control you're kind of like the apathetic <laughs> side of things where you're like the passive things is like ah, right um yeah but either way it sucks it's it, it, it's a response out of neediness it is a response out of this notion of not being able to source your strength from within <laughs> sorry no worries yeah. Woo. Bless you. um i have a couple of dogs and sometimes they get in my nose but um, yeah, it's like not being able to source the strength from within and not being able to understand how to realize here that when you're in a long-term relationship, you're asking your partner a very big ask. And that very big ask is that you're asking them to spend the rest of their life, their one and only life, to spend it with you. Absolutely. And when we haven't been our best self and we realize that our partner wants to go to explore another relationship, that hurts us. But then what really hurts us is not really our partner betraying us, but what hurts us often is, and what should hurt us is the fact that I wasn't the best. Why wasn't I the best? You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I'm going to talk about the feelings and your interpretations of how you dealt with the affair in a bit. But again, just to summarize here, stale for 15 years, uh, you found out about the affair. And I think once you found out about the affair, because the relationship has been so unhappy, she told you, hey, I think I'm going to try a little bit, but I think I'm done. Like, I don't want to be a part of this relationship anymore. So there was this moment where the ball dropped where she said, I'm done with this relationship. When did that come? And how did that come for you? So um, it actually, I, I guess this this went on for a couple more weekends. And then... Um, at, at that point, here's what happened. One of the nights I, I thought I was going to have an aha moment and be like, hey, you know, I know what you're doing. I know where you're going. And I was going to confirm it. In my mind, I thought it was going to be a, a conversation of, well, you know, that's that's what I had to do because you're not you're not here for me. And I thought we would have a conversation about it and somehow we would reconcile. But what ended up happening was because I was not bulletproof then, the second the conversation came up and I said, well, I can prove that something's going on. She said, well, no, you can't. I, I grabbed the phone from her. I went to her text conversations. Clearly the conversations were deleted. They weren't there. And she denied that anything was going on, you know? And so that led me to be me being very, very angry. And all the emotions and everything that I had been pinning up for, for three, four weeks finally came out, right? And because I, I, I'm a calm person, but when I go to 100, unfortunately I go to 100, you know? And so we had really bad argument that night. And um, essentially, you know, the next morning she got up and I could tell something was completely different. And she said, you know what? I'm really done with this with this relationship. I'm really done with, with me and you. I really think we need time apart. And um, I'm going to start looking for an apartment. And at that point, I had no hope. I was just like, I mean, what can I expect? You know? This is exactly what's going to take place. This was going to happen. And so about two weeks of that went, went on of, of us being in there. And, and literally, Jeff, it was it was strange. It was odd. It was like living with a stranger, you know. And I try my best to just walk on eggshells and not say anything and, and not have any conversations, really, because I didn't know. What did she 
But at this point, did she even want to talk about the relationship or was she like basically told you like, I'm done, there's nothing to talk about? Oh, no, sir. There was no, there was no talking about the conversation. No, sir. As a matter of fact, the, the comment was, Hey, I like this co-parenting thing we're doing. Cause literally we're just taking care of the kids. I like this co-parenting thing we're doing, but, uh, I, there's no marriage. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who are listening to this, just know that this is standard. Like we enroll a thousand five hundred people every single year and all those thousand five hundred wait till things are very dire before they seek my help. And things are dire when they can't talk about the relationship anymore. They can't talk about their changes anymore. They can't communicate anymore. Or the communication, the lines of communication have been shut down. So if you're looking at this and going like, my situation, my wife is to shut down. She doesn't have any hope. Yeah. So what, right? It's not unique. No one's situation is really that unique. So fast forward then. Okay, we have kind of a clear picture, I think, understanding of where you started, how you started. Fast forward to now. What's what's it like now? Well, um, it's there's only one way I can put it. It's absolutely beautiful now. And we have open communication. Um, we can't wait to see each other. Um, I had a couple of texts that I've actually saved screenshots from because because they meant so much to me. Uh, text like, you know, hey, honey, I, I can't wait for it to be Friday so we can spend the weekend together. Um, you know, we're doing things together. We, I don't know, we're we're inseparable. It's yeah, inseparable again. It. And like, I'm going to show in the beginning of this video, like, uh, I think I'm going to show some of the screenshots of the text that you send and so on, just to prove to people like, this is legit. Like, this is not just you saying, oh, this is great now. No, this is actually legit, right? Uh, Absolutely. But, Hey guys, I'm going to take a quick detour here and show you what I mean. So this is a legitimate post that Julio made. So I'm going to pause it here if you want to pause it here as well. It's a very beautiful story. Right? So let me pause it here if you want to read it. I'm not going to read everything here because there's a lot. And this is what uh, his partner said. And if you go into his profile, you can see that things are indeed good <laughs> it's posting vacations everything like that so yeah this is again proof guys we're not making any of this up right this is real stuff i want to dive deeper into um this concept of the affair for a bit and dive into like the different dimensions of that yeah. so the first thing i think that i think a lot of people are wondering is why would you want to reconcile with a partner who had an affair? Why do you care? Why do you want to get this relationship back? Uh, actually, to be honest with you, the reason is because of something you said in, in the class. And it was, I don't remember verbatim, but uh, paraphrasing, you can't judge character, you have to judge the environment. So it's, it's tough for me in the beginning to, because here's what happens. When someone has an affair, you immediately go about it. Why did you do this to me? We're the victim. They did it to me we or did it to us. We don't think about the things that we did that led to that. Um, one of the things that you say in the class or in, in the course that I love is when you can really say, I know exactly why you did that. I would have felt the same way and truly mean it on the inside, you know, because if you can't really do that, then, and honestly, you're not seeing the bigger picture. So to answer your question, why I reconcile? Well, I had to be a better version of myself. Why would she want a version of me that I didn't even like, right? I didn't like that version of myself, stress, overweight, angry with everyone, uh, including my kids, my family. Uh, and so I wanted to, because I knew that I could do better. I could win at the game of life. I think you said that as well. You have to make it a game. I'm a competitive person. So it became a game to me. Okay, can I be a better person? What can I do so that she does choose me at the end and not someone else? It wasn't even about the other person at that point. Gotcha. I think I can relate to that pretty heavily because, you know, I, before I was in this relationship, um, I had a lot of partners who actually had an affair with me as well. We were married, but you know, when you're together, right? Yeah. You expect to be together. And I always blame them at first. And I always played the high value man card of like, if they had an affair, fuck them. You know, I guess their fault. 
Like, yeah. I don't give a shit. I want, I want someone better than, I want a woman who's loyal, whatever it is. But then it kept happening. And it kept happening. I can either say, all these women are crazy, or I can say, maybe there's something starkly wrong with me. Right. And I think the realization that I had that really woke me up and actually what got me to even start this business in the first place to help men like you is, I realized this. Again, going back to the example of, you're asking your partner a very big ask to spend their one and only life, their one and only consciousness, their one and only being with you, right? And you're not just asking them to do this. You're demanding them to do this. You are controlling them. You're trying to manipulate them into doing this. You're basically saying, I don't care what reasons you have. I don't care how shitty I am. I don't care how crappy I am. I don't care what I lack. I don't care how unhappy I make you feel. You are supposed to stay with me. And so when they have an affair, we got pissed off. Yep. Because we're coming from this very selfish place. But we delude ourselves into thinking that we're powerful. We're coming from this like high value place. While in fact, we're not. We're actually very controlling. We're actually very manipulative. If you look at it that way. All right. So we look at your partner having an affair and we villainize our partners normally. Oh, the affair partner is always at fault. But which is more villainizing? Okay. Someone having an affair or someone dominating, manipulating, and controlling the other person and force them to stay in the relationship and villainizing them if they choose to not stay in the relationship because they're unhappy. Because you do not understand how to make them happy. Right? To me, I don't know. It's not a black and white answer. I think both are villains in different ways. Right. And I think what you said on get yourself to the position where you can finally say that if I were you, I'd have done, thought, felt exactly the same. You know, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I used to dream a lot about what kind of relationship I want to have. I want to meet this princess, right? <laughs> Who I feel so fulfilled by emotionally, sexually, right? Or like intellectually where I can share life together. Imagine if I met someone and they didn't give me that fantasy. They fell so far short. And I have to constantly lower the bar in which I expect that of myself. All these dreams, I have to suppress it. I have to kill it because this person is not going to give it to me. And then I have to spend the rest of my life with this person. If I don't, I'll become a villain. That's a very sad life. And I think if I was your partner or what was uh, the other partners that left, right? I would think the same. I was like, yeah, I would leave too. I wouldn't stay here. You're trying to get them to meet an expectation that you have um, without you supporting them. There, there's there's ex expectations that we set and, and it all, all it does is set itself for failure because it's never going to be there. It's exactly what you just said. You you were expecting this princess and then uh, the ugliest sister showed up and now you're mad because you even you can't do anything with that, right? And, and there's so much work from our side also. Uh, so much, and honestly, is, and I don't know where along this this chat we're gonna talk about this, but it's, it's really, I love the process, Jeff. I love putting the work in and, you know, I'm, I'm there's no perfection. I catch myself every day reacting to things different ways. And when I think, okay, I've gotten to a point where I want to do it that way, uh, mm -hmm. even with my children, you know, it's not, that's one thing I've loved about the program that it's not, hasn't just been about the relationship, my wife, but the relationships that have improved all the way around me, my kids, my parents, my clients, you know, it's, everything is so much better. And, and I love when people come to me, they go, man, it's, it's really easy to talk to you. How do you do that? How do you always find a solution? And yeah, you know, I say, I can't give away my secrets. <laughs> Here, this is this is Asian guy. That's right. <laughs> From the That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, to make the quick answer, uh, long answer short of like, why reconcile with a person who had an affair? I think you realize at some point, no, there was my 50%, right? There was my contribution to this. And I think as men, Competitive men, usually, we often say to ourselves, 
no way. No way the chapter is going to end like this. No way the book's going to end like this, right? No, no freaking way. Like, that's it. If once you realize your flaw in this, that you weren't re- irreplaceable, that you weren't the best, once you know that, you can't unknow that. <laughs> Correct. And you're like, no way. Uh, so you're going to do whatever it takes to make, make sure that the book ends in a different way. Your chapter, awesome. your book en- ends in a different way. So I think that was the driving force. It's not really to really get your partner back, but really that this, her having an affair really made you realize some things about yourself. And once you realize that, you're like, that's it. That's what I need to focus on. I need to focus on growing myself to become irreplaceable. If I do that, it doesn't matter if she comes back or not. I want to rescue myself here. This is rescuing my, myself, not rescuing this relationship. A hundred percent. That's exactly right. I, I live by a motto even long before I come across you. And that is uh, either learn or I, I win or I learn. I don't see anything as a loser, mm. you know, and that's it. That's me. And I just wasn't driving that far enough. And somewhere along the way, hey, I thought I can be however I want to be. I can be a dick every day. And because death do us part, said it, when we put our rings on, she just has to deal with it. Yeah. And that's just not life. Now, the other aspect of the affair, I think, that people are wondering about is not only the first one is, again, we talked about why do you even want to come back to someone who had an affair? Second is, can you? have trust can you develop trust after an affair like you've obviously done it so you tell me like how you see it how you interpret it how you build that trust back in the relationship after the affair well uh, here's the way that i see it first i can't hang on to something that happened because it, at the end of the day it's only gonna affect me to constantly be wondering why right um something else that i remember from the class is I want her to be here because she wants to be here. Not because I'm begging or enforcing or all those things. And so my trust, the way that I've gained it back really from her is to trust that she wants to be here for herself. Because once we had this conversation, I said, if the day ever comes that I'm not who you want me to be anymore, uh, if whether that is because I'm not fulfilling her needs or I'm not being understanding or there is no emotional safety, or there's none of those things. Um, then I want you to come to me and have the conversation. Hmm. And so I trust it because I, I follow the process and I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be. And I truly feel in the way that our relationship is that she's here because she wants to, not anything else. So trust is there. Yeah. You know, this brings up so many interesting points about what the modern relationship requires. You know, we live in a world now where both men and women, they're empowered. They're empowered to make decisions. They're empowered to do whatever they, whatever they want, really. Meaning that, you know, if you look at, let's say, hunting and gathering days, women didn't have freedom because they're, you know, like not to sound misogynist or whatever, but women are factually, physically, well, a bit weaker than men. They're just biologically, that's just a biological thing, right? So women have to rely back then on the men to hunt and gather, to set up, the hut, whatever it is, right? So in essence, women didn't have the freedom to just up and leave and go like, okay, I'll pick someone else. Absolutely. Then a bit, even like a couple hundred years ago, women weren't allowed to get jobs or like they weren't paid very well. And so they couldn't, couldn't also just up and leave and go like, okay, whatever, right? But right. in this modern day, they can do that. And if your partner is actually a catch, worth fighting for. Damn right, they have options, right? And the truth is that no matter how you cut it, affair or not, the threat of your partner leaving, the threat of them falling in love with someone else, the threat of them getting flirted on, whatever it is, will always be there if they're a catch, right? And so if, let's say, your approach to life is you want to lead by fear, meaning that you want to lead and get loyalty simply because of the title that you're married, whatever it is. You're always going to be sleeping with, with one eye open, affair or not. Because whenever she goes to a conference, whenever she goes to with her girlfriends, whatever, she goes, oh, I have a guy friend, whatever. You get so paranoid and you get so controlling and you try to like get all needy and manipulative because you're still scared of that threat. But what's funny is that that scared, that fear, actually pushes away even more. And that makes your nightmare into a self-fulfilling prophecy of them falling in love with someone else, 
right? And the only way to escape this is if you become irreplaceable. If you source everything from within, you become irreplaceable. You actually understand how to create the high level value. Affair or not, you will know my partner is here because she wants to be, right? It's like my partner too. Like whenever she goes anywhere, she gets guys hitting on her, whatever it is. I don't care. I don't worry about it. I don't get paranoid about it because I'm like, yeah, I give her every reason for her to pick me. And that's all I can do, right? And I know she'll pick me. So Absolutely. this whole concept, so let me finish like, this whole concept of this affair, like how do you build trust after an affair? I think it's a bunch of BS. Because like the principle behind building trust, affair or not, is the same. You have to get your partner to actually want you. And you do that by becoming irreplaceable, right? Sorry, I got you off. No, 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 it's no worries. I, I love it. No, it, it something popped in my head. Um, years ago, if, if my wife would have come home and, and said anything about any other guy, you know, I, I'm not a jealous type, but obviously there was a part of me that was like, okay, that's, that's weird. That guy's funny. That guy's whatever. You've been talking about him a lot, right? I would have had a problem with it, you know? Um, and certainly after an affair, we want to be guarded and we want to have our, our high flags up and our, you know, we want to be looking for everything. I'll give you an example. Christmas time. I'm talking about three or four months ago. Um, you know, she come home and she was talking about she's been having some some deep conversations with a friend of hers at work. It's a man because he's having issues with his wife. And interestingly enough, I was using what I've learned in the program to be her guide for her to help him on some of the things he was having issues with with his wife. Right. And she said, you know, he's having issues with her and he really needs to do some Christmas shopping. And he, he don't, he can't go with his wife, but he needs to do that. You know, I, I don't know what to do to help him. I literally said, well, go pick him up and take him. Y'all go both. You need to do Christmas shopping too, right? Y'all go do that. And I, I, there was no part of me that was worried and any of that. Actually, I was like, cool, she'll be gone. I'm going to go play basketball with my friends while she does that, you know? And so the becoming untethered thing was so great for me. And, and it was strange the way she looked at me when I said, well, go pick him up, take him shopping. It was this like, really? Like, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I mean, I don't, you know, yeah. I had no problems with it. Yeah. And it's a wonderful feeling because you know, that, that's a position where you can not only read your relationship in a very accurate way, right? And you are very certain and confident in your ability to diagnose your own relationship. So when you say to yourself, for example, yeah, she wants to be here. You can say with conviction because you know how to diagnose that relationship properly. And you also know what real value in a relationship looks like as well. And you're operating from that conviction on that side of things. And so when you operate from this level of conviction, you can operate like how you operate, which is you have to do whatever you want. Again, we live by this motto of like, give your partner enough freedom so she can do whatever she wants. She, so she can leave if she wants. But That's it. Yep. learn to treat her well enough so she won't want to. That's it. That's what I was trying to remember. I can't yes. think of it, but that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, I think those are the two main questions I think people would have about the affair. One is like thinking, are you beta for even wanting to uh, reconcile with someone was an affair? We answered like, no. In fact, you're more beta if you can't even look within yourself to actually look at your own flaws. You're, that's the definition of beta. That's the definition of weakness right there. Number two is, hell yeah, you can rebuild trust after an affair the principles doesn't change, whether affair or not. Um, now let's uh, dive deeper into kind of the learning lessons here. I think one of the biggest learning lessons you have is really building what we call the bulletproof vest. And especially in the beginning, you were mentioning how the stresses of life used to bother you a bit and it used to just allow you to let go of your emotions a lot easier. And as much as we like to think that we deserve some respite from all of this to say, I, I deserve a woman who rescues me, <laughs> whatever it is. You're right. The reality is that that is the point of the bulletproof vest. The whole point of the bulletproof vest is not just about dealing with what your relationship gives you, but also what life gives you because life is tough. Life is not easy. So tell me how your philosophy of the Bulletproof Vest has evolved from that beginning stages to how you see it now, how you practice it now, how you build it now, et cetera. Um, I'll give you a little bit of content about my personality. Uh, so I'm an alpha. 
Um, I, for a long time, I was I was actually an executive for a, a Fortune 500 company. I had 400 something employees under me, and naturally a leader. But there was in the last few years, there's a part of me that become to this point where I was looking for someone to pick an argument with me, looking for someone so that I could let some of that anger and some of that stuff go because I felt like that's who I needed to be, right? Mm -hmm. And as you can tell, that happened a lot at home because normally we bring the the higher parts, the worst parts of our personalities, usually with our partners and our family because we feel that's who we can talk to the way that we want to, right? Mm -hmm. So that was my personality then. Got to roll the program and yes, it was complicated. When I remember hitting play and going, holy shit, how many hours is this effort going to be? And how long am I going to have to sit here? Because, you know, I wanted a script. I wanted to say hey, the perfect thing that would fix my problem right now. And, you know, it took 20 years to get the relationship where it was. It's going to take years to get about where I want it to be. And, and that's why I say I work on it all the time. So what I love about the Bulletproof Vest now is that I can take a situation and I think of myself like Captain America. I got my shield. You say what you want because my shield is not going to let that come in through and me take it personal, right? So I practice it by trying to get people to say things in the worst way possible. And there's nothing inside of me that's going, okay, don't say that. Don't say that. No, it's so <laughs> natural. It's so natural. Like, okay, well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. That's your perspective. Let's talk about it. <laughs> you know, I know the thing is not about the thing. Let's get down to what really is bothered. And so that's how I practice. That's how I use it every day. It's funny because like what you're mentioning is um, what we talk about in the program is like the difference between the thriving and surviving mindset, right? And I think when you talk to a lot of people about what it means to manage your emotions, they're talking about literally clenching their asshole to keep their shit in. They're just yep. like keeping it together and they're using like things like breathing exercises, for example, uh, mantras here and there, or just sheer willpower to just keep it together, especially during tough moments. This is not what we mean when we say bulletproof, because if that's the case, if that's your definition, you're surviving, meaning that, yes, it's going to shit and you're holding on for dear life, but with enough crap, you will crumble. And that's why it's a lot of men eventually explode. A lot of men eventually like get angry and they can't really keep things together during the moments that are hard, they regret it, they make a promise, they feel guilty because, they, and then they make a promise, re-promise, I'll do better next time, but they keep falling into the pitfall where they fail over and over again. And over time, they not only lose trust in themselves, but also their partner loses, loses trust in them as well. Because they're like, ah, oh, yeah, this is just him saying like, he'll do better next time, but he can't, right? Um, but if you look at the thriving approach, you look at performers, for example, you know, if you look at the top performers, athletes, dancers, it's not until the moments that are really difficult, really pressure filled that they actually become their best. So it's almost like this inverse correlation where the tougher things get, the better they get. That's thriving. And the only way you can get there is if you understand how to let emotions flow, how to shift your interpretations, how to change your interpretations of how you see the world how you see stonewalling, how you see conflicts, how you see an affair, for example. Yeah. To allow you to just understand how to interpret things a bit differently in your mind. So like, for example, in the previous conversation, we talked about the affair. You know, if you see the affair in that way, in a healthier way, if you find out the, about the affair, it's easier to just go, yeah, I get it. Instead of getting angry or shutting down, you go, I can take it because I understand. And that all changed from the change in your paradigms. And that's beautiful. That's the definition of what it means to be, to be bulletproof. So if, you know, it's funny, and I'll let you talk about this. Sometimes like I get applicants who watch my videos in the bulletproof vest and they go like, yeah, I know how that works, right? But you don't understand, you know, I can be bulletproof. I'm a very bulletproof guy, Jeff. But sometimes my wife says something that just oh, gets me angry. It's like, Bro. you understand that you just literally said to me that you don't, are, are not bulletproof, that you are just surviving, you're not thriving. Because if you're having the thriving mindset, the more crap you get, the more you should rise. Never should you say, I can be bulletproof until this happens. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It, it's, it's, I, lo I love that example because it's literally like you said, oh, hey, I can go out here and, and shoot a bullseye. 
under any circumstance unless there's a fly standing on my ear. I mean, come on, <laughs> you, know, you, you really can't, right? It, it, and I'll give you a beautiful example of something. I was talking to a friend uh, long after I was in your program and he had exactly that question because we have our friends that we trust. I was talking to him about the affair and he couldn't believe that I was staying. He just, he just couldn't believe it. He was like, if it was me, I couldn't do that. I said, yeah, well, you don't, you know, there's a relationship you don't have with your wife. I mean, you and your wife, can you talk about anything? He said, well, absolutely. And I said, okay, so what if she come home and she said, Hey man, uh, I need to talk with you. Um, you know, I think I want to have sex with three, three different guys. I said, how would you react? He said, oh, hell no, that's not happening in my house. And I said, exactly. I said, if my wife came home and she said, that's what she want to talk about, we would have a conversation because there's a reason why she feels that way. Mm -hmm. it, she didn't just decide on it today that that's how she feels, right? And so I'm going to ask the questions. I'm going to ask her and get to the bottom of it. See, what is it that's making you feel that? And then we'll get around it and get over it because does she really want to do that? No, but there's something that's causing her to do that. I love that. And briefly to my next point too, about what it means to actually create safety, especially through the bullet of vest, because I think a lot of the misconception people have about creating safety is just agreeing and going with whatever your partner says, right? Being just a carpet, a doormat, that's not what it is, All right? So let's let's break this down here. So let's say, okay, like this, uh, go along with your example again. Your partner says to you, I want to sleep with the, the other men. I want to have a five sim. That's <laughs> right. Whatever. Right? Yeah. Okay. So let's say that you play the route of what a lot of people do, which is putting their foot down and saying like, no way, man. No way I'm going to stoop down to that level. I'm not beta like that. Right? Let's say you punish her for even expressing that. Okay. Will that change what she feels? Will that actually make her stop feeling like she wants to sleep with other people? No. No. The desire still is still there. What will change though? The only thing that will change just now is that she won't tell you about it next time. She will just do it in secret, which leaves you even more powerless because now you, you have a problem brewing underneath your eyes, but you don't even know that the problem is happening. And so you can't do anything about it. It gives you the sense that you're being powerful, but actually it makes you weaker, objectively weaker. It's almost like... Uh, because we're trying to have a baby of our own right now. And I've been reading a lot of parenting books and thinking a lot about parenting philosophies. And sometimes, you know, when um, kids, they say something bad or they reveal like they want to do something bad, for example, a lot of parents just control them and they go like, you can't do that. You can't do that. And they get mad. And I realized like, it doesn't actually stop the kid from actually doing that thing. The only thing it does is just now the kid is going to do that bad thing by himself or by herself, not telling you, right? And it just makes you more powerless as a parent as well. Same thing if you take a look at executives. You can punish your employees, but all it does is just like, they'll keep doing the bad things. They're still going to be unhappy, but now they just won't tell you about it. They're again, leaving you more, more powerless, right? So is that really a powerful move to go like, oh, no way, I'm not going to let her say that. Or is it more power move, powerful move going, hey, let's create safety here. Let's actually listen to you and understand where you're coming from. Once you create that safety, then come from a place where you're gently coaching each other and gently making suggestions to come to that win-win, right? But you can only come to that win-win again if you create that rapport first with that person, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love the fact that you brought children in, into the conversation because I have two, one is 16, one is 13. <laughs> and yeah, we had a good relationship before them. Kids love their parents, but my daughter who was 16, she don't want to talk to dad a year ago. She want to talk to dad. Dad's scared. Dad reacts. Dad has a deep voice. <laughs> he's tall and he's, you know, it all over the place. And she would talk with mom. And I, I always wanted to have a good relationship with my kids, no matter what it was. I wanted them to be able to come and talk to me no matter what's going on. But I never saw my reaction the way that I was approaching it. And so you're right. It's a great example. Kids are going to do what they're going to do, whether dad says no or don't do this or you yell at them or God forbid people will spank their kids and all those things. It doesn't change how they feel what they want to do. Today, I have a different relationship with my daughter. My daughter, she talks to me about whatever it is. Whether it's her wanting to have sex, she's 16 years old. Unfortunately, kids do that. Um, they don't think about the consequences of it. And she'll come, hey, you know, there's this boy and, you know, we've been whatever, 
and thinking about doing this and that and the other. I don't judge her. I don't go into angry mode. Oh, you can't leave your house. You can't leave the house now. Give me your cell phone. Give me your keys. You can't turn it out. That's not going to change that. Instead, mm-hmm. we sit down, we have a conversation. Okay, what's the smart thing for you to do? Is that really something you want to do now? And if you do decide to do that, how will you make sure that you're safe, you're protecting all those things? And she tells me. And the conversation is over. We move on. At the end of the day, she she hasn't done it yet because she thinks about it from an adult perspective and because she's able to talk with her dad and her mom. And I love that. It is. And, and, and I love that example because I think it shows one, right? You What you want in life is not to suppress problems, right? So you want your children, you want your wife, you want your colleagues, your employees to, for you to be the first person they go to when they have an issue. Yes. That's, that, that's what you want because that empowers you to actually do something. That's what leaders do, right? Leaders don't go like, oh, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> leaders say like, hey, tell me the problems. Let me, let, 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 let's solve it together. And if you put your foot down too early, you're preventing that from happening. They will not go to you. Right? But if you create safety first by actually listening, understanding, you are creating that position where you can empower yourself to do something about it. But I think more importantly, we talk about this philosophical discussion of disabling or enabling behaviors. A lot of people think, for example, that creating safety and just listening to someone enables bad behaviors. But, and, and they think that putting their foot down and saying no disables behaviors. But that's actually the opposite. Again, if you put down... If you put your foot down, it doesn't disable the behavior. In fact, if you, you know, going back to your kid example, she's again going to do stuff in secret and she's going to let her mind go crazy because she's operating by her own knowledge only and she's gonna, probably going to do the thing that you're trying to disable, right? Yeah. But for your case, so now you have a position where your, your daughter wants to talk to you, come to you first. And she feels understood. She feels listened to. She feels heard by you. She feels like you can relate. You're living on the same re- plane of reality. Whenever you give a suggestion now, she, the first thing in her mind would not be, ah, oh, that doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. I don't want to listen to this guy, whatever. Right? Because if you look at a lot of parenting styles, like that's why their kids don't want to listen to them. Because they, they just think, ah, he just doesn't get it. We just live in different worlds. Right? But... If your kid can go, no, he gets it. He understands what I'm feeling. He understands what I'm experiencing. Maybe he actually has some good advice. So that resistance towards your advice actually gets less. So that's how I, what I would think as disabling behaviors in a better way. So screening safety actually allows you to disable bad behaviors faster and more effectively, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the one thing that I would add to that is when I do give a suggestion, because I went from you need to, but I used to be my favorite word. You need to, you need to, do, you need to, do, need to. I don't know what's going on. Now I go from, well, here's my advice or here's my suggestion. I don't expect them to follow it. I don't, because that will even be, if, then it puts me in a position where, well, I spent all this time talking to you. You didn't even listen. No, because at the end of the day, Everyone, partners, kids, whoever it is, they still have to make up their own mind on what they want to do. Mm. We have power enough to be able to guide them. But at the end of the day, if they want to go left, you can't make them go right, no matter how much you think. I love that. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, This is also something I've been thinking about for my own relationship too, because I'm five years older than my partner. So obviously when we met, uh, she just graduated college. I was already in the workforce for a much longer time. Our philosophies in life are very different. So in the early stages, I used to force my partner to like adopt my point of view. No, 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 no. You don't know what you're talking about, right? I've been in the workforce. I know what I'm talking about, okay? Yeah. I'm more mature than you. I've been through this before. I know what I'm talking about. So when I give advice, I always say like, no, 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 just follow me. Trust me. And what's funny is that when my partner just trusted me, logically, just like, oh, I do it because Jeff said so. It didn't stick. The changes never stuck. Right, because it was what I wanted to do, not what she wanted to do. And she doesn't really understand also the the premises of why this decision is good. Again, she can't really surrender to the decision because like, okay, I know this is the right thing to do, but I I, I don't know why, but I feel this temptation to try the other things too. It's almost like when my dad, uh, when I was growing up, right? 
my dad told me like, uh, you know, golf is where you want to go, right? And and I was so close to being a, a professional golfer, but I can never surrender and commit to that decision because I always said like, what if I was a chef? What if I was this? What if I was that? Because I never experienced the other stuff. And so I never got to understand for myself and experience why this decision is the best one, right? And I realized also that it wasn't until I let go and simply said, like, okay, all I can do is plant seeds with my partner and she can do whatever she wants. She can make mistakes here and there and I want her to make the mistakes. And after she makes the mistakes and made the realizations on, on her own is when she goes, oh, that's what Jeff is talking about. This might take a year, might take three years, five years, who knows? But this is how you should coach each other long term like this, allowing people to just realize things and be able to find the right evidence to be able to surrender the decision on their own instead of you telling them what to do, which is not going to stick anyway. You know, and your job in this case is not to make them change the decisions. Is as they make them these mistakes that eventually lead them to the correct decision. Are you going to be the first person they go to? as a place of safety when they're going through difficult moments, et cetera, right? Are you going to be the first person they, they go to? And are you going to be there to give them a good sign, sounding board to make sure that they're coping and they're learning the right lessons from their mistakes, et cetera, right? That's the most beautiful part. That's where change happens, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, like an, another example of that is like uh, using kids as an example, you know? Like, I wish when I was a kid, I made more mistakes. And all I needed was, I want to make mistakes. And for, uh, for me to have a parent, I can go home to and go, hey, here's a mistake. And my parent would go, well, here's how you should see this. Here's how you should, here's how I would see this. Here's how I would kind of reframe this and cope with this. You know, if you look at a lot of kids who have very toxic behaviors, I think they do they have that because they didn't know how to cope with their mistakes. They cope with it with all the wrong interpretations, with the wrong ways of looking at things. And they end up creating a defense mechanism to fix that toxic mistake. Same thing in relationships, right? Same thing in, with your wife too. Like she comes to you, she, she goes through life. And sometimes like her toxic behavior comes from her having this defense mechanisms for the mistakes that she made, which compounds. And she doesn't have anyone to have a sounding board with because there's no safety, you know? Correct. And and that, that goes back to what we're talking about in the beginning. There is no safety. And then oh, suddenly uh, they find someone outside of the house that does offer that safety to them. Right. They listen. They advise. And oh, suddenly when your partner wants to go be with somebody else, oh, suddenly, oh, why did you do that to me? But we were never there to begin with. Right. So it's it's, it's this this paradox that we expect all these things to, to be the way we want them to be. But we don't want to work for it, you yeah. know. We want to have a six pack ab, but we don't ever want to sit down and do a crunch. It, never going to happen, right? We want to win the lottery, but we don't want to go buy a ticket. <laughs> How's how that ever going to work, right? And yeah. so, and so that that's exactly right. I mean, we have to be a guiding light for the things that we know, and the things we don't know is where we go get it from someone else. In this case, I've learned a lot from you, and I've learned a lot from just really slowing down and realizing that I don't know everything. And for me to be a good leader and a good light, I have to go figure out what I don't. Yeah. Let's talk about a bit about that too, because you obviously been successful in a lot of areas of life, right? Yes, sir. And I'm, how old are you now, if you don't mind? I, I'm, I shouldn't be 40 this year. 40, right? So you're about yes, a sir. decade older than I am. Thanks. I mean, it's, <laughs> but, but like my point is like, it oh, must yeah. be hard because very rarely are clients younger than me. Most of my clients are older, much older than I am. What made you humble down and really say like, let me listen to this 30 year old dude? <laughs> well, he, here's, I'll dive into that. First of all, I didn't see you as a 30 year old dude, right? Um, I, I, I saw someone that knew what they were talking about. Clearly I wouldn't have come to Jeff and said, hey Jeff, teach me how to build rockets, right? Because that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about relationships, right? I understand um, uh, someone that was older than me a long time ago said, son, you have to learn 
from others' mistakes because you won't live long enough to make them all yourself. I oh, love that. Mm. Okay. So I've been humble for a long time. And like you, I, when I, I'm actually originally from a country called Honduras in Central America. I came to the United States uh, when I was 12. Before that, there were I, times that I didn't even have shoes to wear. And so I made it a point in life that I was going to be successful no matter what I did. And yes, I was successful in careers and successful in different things, but I wasn't successful in a relationship. Even though I've had one for 22 years, I should be an MVP of relationships, right? But clearly, you knew what you were talking about. And what I love more about it was the fact that you're honest and you said, hey, I went through a bunch of shit before I figured it out. And I love the fact that you don't settle, you rework the program when it needs to be reworked. You change it and you try to make sure there's always at its best. And you keep adding to it and adding to it and adding to it. And man, I hope one day, 10 years down the road, when you're 40, your program is 300 hours long. Because it'll <laughs> be, gonna be shorter. helpful for people. Yeah. So like V3 is yeah, gonna like a bit longer, be, right? Then V4 is going to be a trimmed down, like a leaner version of V3. Uh, so we try to make it leaner because like less is more as well. But I wanted to make sure like in V3, we had all the right content. But yeah, man, like we never stop. Like we never stop scrutinizing our own work, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's like playing golf, right? No matter how many times you go out on our golf course, you always going to improve. I, I shot a 70 today. Tomorrow I got to shoot a 69. And, and hell, you may shoot a 77 or an 80 the next five times. It may never get to 69, but you're trying to get there. And that's what I love about it is you have conviction and you, you've been through it yourself. So I didn't have to humble myself down because I was like, okay, he's a leader at this. I'm going to follow him until I figure it out and I can break off the path and I can start my own path. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Did you explore other programs, therapy, counseling besides my program, or did you just stick with this program? So I found you pretty fast. Um, I did see some other ones about masculinity building and it, it your partner is cheating, it's time to move on and all this nonsense, you know, that I, I didn't really, it didn't make sense to me. I did watch several videos, different things. I probably spent about two weeks exploring, you know, and, and listen to self up stuff, but I come across yours and I was hooked. I, I think I watched all the, the free content that I could and then ended up joining the master class. And I think we had one phone call and I was like, I'm in all the way, <laughs> you know. What was your expectation like before you joined? Because you mentioned earlier that there was a big culture shock in the beginning where it's like, oh my God, this is like a lot of content. This is like, this is not just scripts. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what was your initial impression? And how did that initial impression eventually evolve to where you're actually slowing down, working and making these genuine changes in a proper way rather than just like looking for scripts here and there? So expectation was like, okay, I'm going to hop in here. I'm going to watch these videos and I'm going to know what to say, right? Well, I get in there. I watch the first couple that were, I don't know, four or five hours. And the more I listened, the more I realized how much I didn't know and understand, even though I think I know all these things. And so then it became... I became a hungry, hungry hippo for lack of better terms. And I had to eat all the knowledge. <laughs> then I got hooked. Then I was like, okay, the next one, the next one, the next one. And I remember very early on applying some principles that I learned in the first module and just how well it worked. Hmm. And I was like, wow, if that's working, I can't wait to get to the next part and the next part so I can continue to build this pyramid and have this amazing base, this foundation that I can grow from so I can go and have a great relationship. Yeah. I was hooked by the information. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's briefly to my last point, which is like this concept of untethering that we always talk about. And it's really about getting yourself hooked to the processes. It's you do the process not because you want to have, you do the process because you are. And what's ironic is if you do the process because you want to have, especially in the context of a relationship, if you do the process because you want to have, ironically, you will never have. Because your partner wants to know, are your changes real, permanent, genuine, and or are they conditional? 
But if you do your changes because you want to have, having meaning like you want to get your partner back, she can see and sense through your micro expressions and micro tones that you're doing this to get her back. Once you get her back, you're probably, that motivator is going to, is going to go away and you're probably going to go back to your old ways again. Right? She knows that and she can smell that from a mile away. So if you do because you want to have, you will never have. But if you do because you are and you can let go of that outcome, ironically, that's when you have. Right? If you can effortlessly be so that you can effortlessly do so that you can effortlessly have, that's when you have your outcome. Uh, and it's a very paradoxical thing that people often don't understand, right? Yeah, it's like grabbing a handful of water. Your hand is wet, but you have nothing. Yeah. Right? So if you want water, you have to bring a bucket. Yeah. And the bucket is truly making a change and being able to do it every day, um, for it to just float. It, you, it, you can't make yourself be different, right? Like you just said, because eventually when the eyes are not on you, you go back to being yourself, the, the old self that you are mm -hmm. and know who you're trying to become. And yes, if you're, uh, I'm going to do this right now so that you can see that I'm a little different. Yeah, it smells like skunk. Come on now. Yeah. You're not really doing it because you want to. And this is why I say like, there's no shortcuts because even if there are shortcuts, even if there was a perfect script, the perfect thing you can say, the perfect thing you can do. It's not about what you do, but how your partner interprets it. So let's say you do this perfect thing, this perfect action, perfect words. Your partner's still going to think that's fake. So there are no shortcuts because the only way you can do this is you grow genuinely inside to where you can be so consistent through her tests, her challenges over time. You can show time and time again, every single day, that your changes are real, that your changes are here to stay, whether through thick or thin, she wants to divorce or not, it's like, doesn't change what I do. Only then can you actually get her back. And the only way to do that is if you, if you are not only just untethered towards the outcome, where you don't even look at the outcome, it's like, whatever, I don't care. But you fall in love with the process that you talked about, where the process becomes the purpose. For process becomes the outcome, the destination. You're still hooked on it. Because if you're not hooked on it, if you don't enjoy it, you're never going to get there. You're never going to get to the point where you do because you are. 100%. That that's, has been my, my favorite part about it. And in reality, it applies to anything in life. I mean, um, LeBron James didn't become the basketball player he is because one day he showed up and he wanted to be one, right? Mm. Hussein Bolt isn't the fastest man alive because one day he decided he wanted to. No. Uh, Bill Gates doesn't have whatever size company he's got today. I don't know if it's third or fourth and the most in the world because one day he showed up and said, oh, I want to be this guy, right? Mm. It's taking years of work and putting it in. And I can guarantee you one thing, any of the guys that I just mentioned, didn't say one day I will be the best basketball player or the fastest runner or one of the richest men on the planet. No, they went to work and they put it in. Yep. And whatever the result was, it was going to come when it was going to come. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's also been misunderstood by a lot of people too, of how true performers actually work, right? True performers, like I think the media likes to glorify them to be like, oh yeah, I knew I was going to be number one since I was a kid. It's like, that's not true. Right? Nobody does that. The, tr the truth is that they fell in love with the process. They fell in love with the practice to become the best. And they practice rain or shine. They practice after they get a good result. They practice the same after they get a better, better result. Their practice, their process doesn't change. And because of that relentless process, they suddenly go, oh shit, I'm in the NBA. Oh, I'm the MVP. Right? In your case, oh, I reconciled. No, it just, it just happened. It happened one day and, and it was interesting because I didn't even see it coming. Uh, by the way, uh, my wife never moved out. Not one time. <laughs> we, we stayed in the house and it was odd for a while. And um, we were always going to bed together when it was time to go to sleep. And, and early on when this was going on, she would go to sleep and Julio would stay on the program and watch seven hours content. Right? <laughs> and he would go to bed when he went to bed. It, it, and it wasn't it was funny because at the beginning it was like, do I go to bed and be present or do I watch my stuff? You know? And then it was like, okay, 
this is what Jeff means by being on tether. I can't worry about what's going on in her mind. I can't worry about what she's thinking about. I can't worry about, I got to worry about me becoming 2.0 and 3.0 and 4.0 and so on and so forth. Or so yeah. putting in that work, no matter what else is going on. Yeah. And I'll close with this uh, topic too, because I think this is another part that people misunderstand too, is when you said, for example, like, I don't really care what's going on in her mind. Right. And I just care about my, my process. Well, part of the process is to be able to start conversations, to know what's in her mind. Right. That is the process. So, but, but the point is like, you're not focused on overanalyzing what's in her mind. You just focus on, okay, what is the process to actually understand what's in her mind? Right. Make it feel understood. So again, it goes, always goes back to process, never goes back to the circumstance, the outcome, whatever it is. So I hope that makes sense for a lot of people. And there's no misunderstandings here as well. But Julio, I think that's about an hour. Uh, I don't want to take more of your time, but any last words for people who are who were in your position in the beginning, uh, who are who are in your position, who are in the position that you are in right now, what would be the first piece of advice that you would give them just to get them off the dip, the trough they're in right now? Well, and, and I thought a lot about, about this because uh, I know you're going to ask me. And the first thing I would say is if, if you're an alpha male, and you're thinking about joining this program and you have an ego, come back later. Leave your ego somewhere else because your ego is not going to allow you to really listen, take in, absorb, and really truly try to make a change for you, not for anyone else, not for the partner you're trying to win back, not for all those things, but for you yourself. Put the ego down. The ego's got to go. And solely focus on the process and put in the hours, put in the time and know that eventually there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Even though it seems hopeless today and you think that you have to make a change right now and you're going to find a result for it tomorrow and you're going to find this perfect words, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It took years to get you to where you are. It's going to take years to get you where you want to be. Put that work in, let go of that ego. I love it. I love it. And I think the ego thing is such a good reminder because, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but we actually turn down like 90% of clients that we get because in that initial phone call, we want to see is like, do they have a lot of ego blocking their learning, blocking their ability to learn? Are they a clean canvas or are they already a full canvas? Are they a full cup or an empty cup? And what's funny is sometimes we turn people down and they instantly get pissed. <laughs> and I'm like, this is exactly why. You can't even take feedback. You can't even take, you can't even be coached. You can't even hear the hard truths, right? You want to hear what you want to hear. Um, so yeah, get rid of that. Like no one can fill in a, a cup that's already full, right? If your cup is already full, empty it. And I want to end with this quote too of like, you can't use the same thinking that created the, for a problem, uh, created the promise in the first place to solve your problem, right? So Understand that your current paradigms got you to where you are and it will take a completely different set of paradigms to get you to where you want to be. You, you have to abandon the old paradigms completely if you want to go somewhere different. So Julio, thank you so much for dedicating an hour to this. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this because I feel like we, you know, whenever we talk about the concept of an affair, it's so controversial. It's like, oh, people like love to eat up that shit and go, Oh, what a beta, whatever it is. And I feel like we dispelled a lot of the different mindset myths and the faulty ways of thinking and looking at this, especially in the modern relationships. And I appreciate your honesty around that as well. So thank you for gifting us with this, all this insight. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Anytime I'm always available and I hope other guys really, truly listen. And uh, I wish many more relationships go out there. Let, let's drive that divorce percent rate of 50% down to 0%. That's good. We're not betas, right? We're, we're, we're not bad. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. So we'll close with that. Now, in the meantime, if you want to learn more about what Julio is talking about here, all the processes to get you from zero to 100, uh, you can join me in my masterclass down below this video. Um, the masterclass is going to be about an hour and a half long. At the end of the masterclass also, I'll show you how to apply for the program. Uh, be sure to pay attention to the application process very closely. We are very selective of the people we choose. We only take in less than 10% of people. 
So make sure you pay attention to the application process. Treat it like you would apply if you're like applying for a dream job or, you know, university, whatever it is, you know, care about it. But in the meantime, guys, I'll hope to see you, a lot of you in the program soon and change your lives in massive ways. But yeah, Julio, guys, signing off. See ya. What do you think, Julio? Man, I love it. I love it. Hope yeah, helps helps a lot of people, man. And uh, it's funny, a year ago here, I'm looking for something to help me along the path. And there was your face. Did I little ever think that I'd be doing an interview with you? So, you know, <laughs> I feel like I met a celebrity a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. just a normal dude. I, I, I always tell Jason this because like, um, you know, I, I only hire my clients, right? So when Jason came on board, he was always like, really nervous around me. I'm like, dude, Here's a picture of me in my boxer shorts, like legit. Let's just get it over with. I'm just a normal dude <laughs> doing stupid shit. Yeah. <laughs> I just happen to know more about the subject than most people. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious. It's obvious that you're passionate about it. It's obvious that you truly are, are looking to, to help people. And, uh, you know, I, I, I live by that a little bit. I try to bless someone every day, one way or the other. Um, and, and it's funny that I didn't mention this during our conversation, but um, I always think that I have a real high IQ and I've come to realize that my wife's IQ is way higher than mine, you know? And so I, I got to just, hey, you know, I'm here and and we're going to work this together. And uh, brother, I, I can't tell you, March of 2021 was a terrible month for me. Terrible month. As as I wrote down on my thing, man, there was that one day I left and, and I said, you want to be alive. You it's know, so man. poetic that it's, uh, we're recording this in March now, so. Absolutely, brother. I, I was like, when you, when you reached out and I was like, wow, I think it's been, I didn't realize it was March not March night. I, I thought it was actually closer to April. So when you said that, I was like, wow, it's exactly been a year. And I never would have thought, honestly, when I first started, I was like, you know what? This is not going to work out. She's going to move out. And I was at peace with it. You know, I, that's okay. But I'm going to be, for the next relationship, I'm going to be my best version of myself. Yeah. And little by little, man, it just, you know, it just kind of drop by drop the chain. Yeah. It's like the outcomes keep, keep surprising you. Um, cause like if I look at my life too, you know, everything I wanted never came true, but better, like legit life gave me so much better than I ever wanted. Right. And it's just like, I just focus on the process every day. It's just like, I just focus on the process of what it means to win quit tweaking that process. And then life just keeps surprising me with all these crazy rewards, you know, like going like, like you, you know, going from a little Indonesian boy living in a hut with nothing to his name, with an outhouse for a toilet, doesn't even have a flush kind of thing now to where I'm taking home legit like $2 million a year doing what I do. That's so amazing. That's so I mean, amazing. I look. It's just like, I can't believe where I am, you know? And I'm sure like you feel a lot the same with your relationship, with your work too. just focus on the process, you know? Yeah, that's it. it, it and I think that's a, that's a big thing. I mean, how, how do you go from, Hey, I'm looking for an apartment to, um, we walked the property two weeks ago where we're going to be building a dream home. That's awesome. And, and you know, she's, she's excited and you know, she's ready to pick things out and tile and hardwood. And a March a year ago, we were trying to figure out how we're going to co-parent from a distance. You know, and so it's, it, life is interesting, brother. And, um, you've made it better for me. And, uh, I, I just, like I said, I keep going, I keep hearing about a new version. And so I'm getting ready to dedicate some time to the new version because I, I want to know more. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We have the first four phases done. Phase five is going to be done in a bit. Uh, phase six is going to be done in a bit too. So it's, it's a whole new course <laughs> than you want you to. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, I, I know I mentioned this to you last year. Yeah. Hey, anytime you have staffing openings, I'd love to be able to help someone. Yeah, and it's not even about money for me. It's I, I'd love to be part of, of something hey, like this. Yeah, so for sure. Um, again, we have like a line of people wanting to work for us. Sure, I bet. Right? Yeah. Uh, which is a wonderful thing to have. So uh, whenever we're looking, I'll definitely keep you in that bucket list. Yeah, and man. And we'll go from there. Awesome, brother. Hey, man, I appreciate you. And uh, I love you, man. I really do. Thank you so much for being you. Thanks, Julio. See you, brother. Appreciate you too. Bye. Yes, bye.